Hey, Lara. Okay, can I just blame the fact I only left Microsoft three weeks ago and your good slides just doesn't matter. I miss PowerPoint. And I haven't used a Mac in 22 years, so it's not a great combination, the first time presenting with either of these things. Uh, welcome to Criminal Cooperation Lessons from the Dark Side. Uh, I don't think I have to explain DARF, uh, but I will explain um, the donut in a second. So, what, ooh, aha. Uh, what we're going to talk about today, I'll briefly look at who I am. I apologize for it not going full screen. I can't figure it out. Um, why Lessons from the Dark Side? Why was I even thinking of looking at it from that angle? Uh, legacy, a tale of the creation of the nemesis, silo. Um, present day, tag, IoT, we're all individuals. Oh, come on, someone. No? I'm not. No, no fans. Um, I, very, I feel like this is really bad because Heather's talk was amazing and I feel like this is maybe too bad. Um, a very brief tour of the evolution of cyber history, cyber criminal cooperation, Look at a case study, and that wasn't me who touch anything. Um, what is the key to their success, and what can we do? And the only thing more dangerous than the developer is the developer conspiring with security. Uh, just quickly, who I am. Um, my name is Lara Sunday. Uh, up until three and a half weeks ago, I was a cloud solution and security architect at Microsoft. Um, I'm now a product manager at Rapid7. Oh, I'll try to remember this, we'll, we'll get through it. Um, so yeah, so I recently changed product management for the Insight Cloud Tech tool, which is a cloud screen policy management tool. Um, thank you. Awesome. I don't work in IT. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. Okay, so yes, so this is me, that's me. The reason there's a wave there is when I'm not at work or looking after my kids, I'm usually out or in the water. And that's me. Uh, now, where's next? Try this. Okay, why lessons from the dark side? So earlier this year, I was at um, a session run by a vendor, and they put a slide up, and it was like looking at the business of how criminals work. And I kind of obviously had thought about it before, but it got me thinking, I was like, that's a great, like, that's very functional, isn't it? Look at those workflows and processes. Um, if we think about it, so there's been some sort of economic studies, it's the third largest economy after the US and China. That's a lot. Someone is making a lot of money, and it's easy money, right? Do you want to rob a bank? What way do you want to rob it? Do you want to go in there with a gun and maybe get hurt? Or do you want to go to the computer? You're just going to have to listen to my voice, maybe. We'll see. <laughs> so, in our major threat report, people are still not patching, people are still not doing their hygiene. 40% um, of incidents are still down to things like not having MFA implemented. Ransomware accounts. I think this is pretty conservative, um, but first half of the year, 1,500 victims worldwide. Could be a lot more of that, because that's just what we're tracking. And dark web marketplaces are thriving. Have you heard that term, thriving, being applied to any other sort of business in the past year? Like, we're all feeling the pain, especially in IT at the minute. But dark web marketplaces are thriving. So I just want to speak about, so this all got me thinking about how we work together. I'm an anthropologist, that was my degree, so I'm very interested in people. And one of the things I encountered when I changed career four years ago and joined Microsoft, was that we're sometimes terrible at working together. Um, and it because, so a silo is a, a silo, it's an isolated instance of something. Um, but it comes out of the physicality of legacy, right? You used to have to walk down the hall to get to your sack to talk to Jane down there, or the AD team over there, or the endpoint team. And for a long time, there was this image of the castle and we're defenders. You know, and then we all had our little castles independently within that, and you had a big firewall, and that's what kept everybody safe. Now the world is very, very different. We have the cloud, we have IoT, we're all individuals within that, we're all doing our own things, but we're all interconnected. Like we talk about air gap now, is anything really, really, truly air gap? Really? And the challenge we have as a community 
is we took the legacy mindset of this is my team, you do security over there, you're a developer over there, you're a BAU team, you're a governance person. And we took this mentality with us into this new world of technology, which quite frankly is not really working. Um, and we still keep telling ourselves the same dialogues that from what I've read about, I kind of thought it was a cliche when I joined security that we were perceived as boring and bad. And developers were exciting and didn't want, you know, they didn't care about security. It is not true on either side of that, is my experience. So, I'm not going to dig, I tried to dig into this, but there's too many um, for the time that we have. But this is a very, very brief tour. Wow. <laughs> It really keeps clicking on. I should just like share and turn my laptop around and move that stuff. Um, very brief tour of the evolution of cyber. I'm not actually going to go um, through each of these. And I know I've missed things and I do apologize. But I wanted to point some things out. So, Tech Model Railroad Club. Anybody shout out, I'll buy you a donut later, uh, what they're kind of famous for? Hackers. Yes. Who is that? Why do you paint it? Or don't, whatever you can find. So yeah, so the Tech Model Railroad Club by MIT, uh, they actually was your model uh, trains, but uh, you have the Signals and Power Subcommittee to thank for hacking. So they each had committees, some paint, painted trees and things, and some did the trains, and there was the Signals, you know, the guys who were into creating signals. Um, so yeah, so I wanted to point that out. I'm going to skip to the 70s. Creeper virus, uh, Royal Thomas, 1971, so Apprehend had been created in 1969. He sent around a worm um, that said, um, I'm a creeper catcher if you can. Uh, it was excessive, it replicated excessively, was the word they used, and he felt really bad. He hadn't intended that. Um, what is interesting is the name Creeper comes from a Scooby Doo robber character, which I thought I kind of thought was quite prophetic for what it's used for in the future. Freaking, there's a load of names and people, but it's telephone lines, 2,600 hertz is the same as the telephone lines you can replicate and do free calls. Um, but that really created a subculture that then infused 80s, 90s, 2000s, where we are now. Briefly, the 80s, The Cuckoo's Egg, really great book, um, if anybody hasn't read it. A uh, story of Crystal, I think his boss told him in 1976 to find a 75 cent discrepancy um, in how their computers are being used. And he hunted, but he actually like kept a diary. It's really interesting. But like from a forensics point of view, of hunting this agent down, um, it was Marcus Hess um, situated. And he was actually selling the data he was getting to the KGB. So it's kind of early state kind of sponsored actors type thing, and um, why sort of I mention it. Uh, Half the Planet, the 90s, best soundtrack to a film ever. Um, 2000s and 90s, you know, the accessibility of the internet, the accessibility to technology is much more available to everybody. Where are we going? Um, Anissa, the European uh, cybersecurity, you can look at their threats fast forward, it's a bit depressing, but it's good to give an overview of what 2030 might look like. AI and quantum, so it was a very brief, Sure. So, I feel really bad about this. I do apologize. Like, I'm not touching it. <laughs> um, how do cyber criminals cooperate? Um, so, it's broken down, and I'll, I'll go into that in a bit of detail of services, distribution, monetization. I haven't kind of touched on some of those elements that you can see. I promise I'm not doing anything. Um, one mic. But I wanted to bring it down to an individual team initially. So Matt Carey at the time in 2017 when he produced this report, he was the security ops um, at NISC. So a team leader is kind of pretty much what you imagine. They, it's like George Kimmy in Ocean's Eleven. They come up with a plan, they get everybody together. It sounds like a bit like a product manager when I was reading this. Coders, malware creators, um, I'm sure there's a lot of interested people who would be very confident, maybe sitting in the audience. Network administrators. This is scalability, so not every team would have a network administrator, but this is if you want scalability and can DDoS hacks and things. Intrusion specialists. Um, once you've gained access, they would like your global admin and they would like to naturally move and find interesting ways and find out as much as they can and as fast as they can. And maybe do it quietly. Maybe like say, 
two years. I actually have, like, nation states, I would reckon, are in most people's systems for a very, 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 very long time. Um, data miners, so you actually get a load of data, right? But it's messy. It's not cleaned. How do you make it, send, you know, how do you make it a product that anybody wants to buy? So their job is to kind of clean it up. And then they move it to the money specialist, which is your seller. They're identifying the markets who you want to sell it to. It's also, it's a very business. It's very, you know, the roles are quite straightforward. It's function. <laughs> so Catalin Simpano in 2021 wrote a great article based off Pride Strikes 2021 fair report. It's got a great infographic. I'm not going to drill into any of these, but it breaks down the services, distribution, and monetization. Um, so you've got things like credit debit card testing. You know, is it a valid credit card that you can use? Distribution. Um, spam campaigns, you have to, you know, well, I'll not read the, the slide, but if you want to, you can look up his uh, article and it kind of breaks them all down. It's very interesting. Okay. So I could have picked, I was thinking I'd do an absolute, like, you do a pick as a case study. Has anybody been keep, keeping track of the past week of MGM? Any time? Baby, it's baby. <laughs> oh, so yeah. I was like, do I do use it? But I just thought it was a good example because um, they put out their statement and that just got me there. <laughs> so Alfie, Black Cat, formerly known as Dark Matter, Dark Side, Colonial Pipeline Tech, do you know That was messy. It really impacted the the world. Um, they provide, so this is their business model, they provide great incentives if you affiliate with them. Like, you will get 80 to 90 percent of the ransom if you work with them. Wow. Like, that's take home, right? Um, they use their recruitment, um, when we think about how they're recruiting new people enthusiastically and exploit forum, round five, places like that. And it's kind of like this tricky road of like, I don't know, you start modding your game and then suddenly you're <laughs> involved in a, a cyber criminal organization. But it happens. You talk to some of the kids, you know, teenagers that have been caught out, and you're like, oh, I didn't think I was doing anything really bad in the real world. Um, they're quite renowned, they use Rust. It's a highly high performing language program that um, works on both Linux and Windows. Um, they first, yeah, 2021 was when it first came about. Also known for three stages of like, like three stages of extortion. They like to be multi-talented. So the first stage they get your credential theft. The reason I have a spider, and I just want to put a caveat in with all of this, nothing has been verified. I am not gonna talk about slot machines in case someone gets angry. Like none of this is just but it's just a thought I've been thinking about. Um, so the first stage of credential theft, possibly scattered spider who do social uh, phishing, engineering, phone calls and such, have maybe, possibly been involved in this, nothing's good, I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm not saying, it's just this is what people are talking about. Uh, working with Alfie Black Hat uh, to take time out. Um, so I just wanted to put that there. And they're actually still using tactics, like social engineering tactics that Susie Thunder was using in the 70s. So it's quite interesting how that's kind of evolved. But what really interested me about Alfie and this attack is they put on Thursday, last Thursday night, they put a statement out. MGM paid for the most expensive pen test in the world. Unsolicited. <laughs> but they got, they got critiqued. And I thought it was really unusual. How many crimes can you think of where the attacker or the extortionist feels like they can critique you on how bad a victim or good a victim you are. <laughs> this is what they did. So they said things like, inadequate administrative capabilities and weak incident response playbooks. <laughs> That's very professional. That's very, like, I would expect that when your CEO went to PwC and got a report in or something, and they came up with this. Um, I don't know, I have no idea of the details. They might have good playbooks, they might have bad playbooks. I don't know. Due to their network engineers' lack of understanding of the, how the network functions. And I thought, A, this was pretty shitty to do, you know, pick on the engineers. Also, how many of you in this sort of like are really confident 
that you know every bit of your environment. You know everything that's going on in your organization. And I have a show of hands, you can hand and heart say, I know everything. Everywhere, on-prem, cloud, we're all totally confident in that. No? I mean, I know I, I'm not, I, you know, I've seen customers' environments. I wouldn't like, you know, I don't blame a network engineer for not knowing everything. And the very going back to like, right, there is real people impacted by this. So they are given their critique and being annoyed because the victim is not, you know, cooperating efficiently with them. There's a young person who started a job recently at that casino, hasn't got his first paycheck. That's sometimes the difference between, you know, buying food in a week. Right, this is really a joke, and I will make more jokes, but it's really not funny. People die, people are abused, people lose their jobs. It's not funny, it's not. But what is interesting, what I really find interesting is they think, this is a deal, they call it a deal, it's not extortion. They are doing a deal. They are doing business with you. This is a new type of business. You're going to pay for the business. I'm not sure what the service is. A really expensive pen test. But it's easier for cyber criminals, right? So we kind of tell ourselves in security something, but they've got it easier than us, right? They have clear key performance indicators. They know exactly what they're going for. You know, what the amount of money is they want, whatever, they look at it, they don't. They understand their role and functions. Do you, like, does everybody feel really confident sometimes? And, like, who's meant to be responsible for what part of cloud security foster management? They can get interested. They can be really much more agile than sometimes we can uh, with who they work with. Easier to adopt technology. If it doesn't work, you won't use it, and you'll probably give someone a really hard time or whatever form you picked it up on. And an enthusiastic and talented pipeline, right? It's exciting, the huge kudos, you know, it's, and it's coming through. There's like, they're making trillions. It's the third biggest economy. So I was thinking when I was, because these are stories I've told, like it's so much easier for them than it is for us. We have to defend everything. They have to think of one thing. I was telling myself that quite a lot over the past couple of years. And I was like, well, what is the key to their success? Why do they find it easier than we do? And this is just like me thinking, so please, this is not like a <laughs> this is just like me ruminating. I would love to like discuss this and have thoughts. Um, it's collaboration. They collaborate more efficiently and more effectively than us. So earlier this year, I attended Cyber UK. It was really, I'd never been to an like, in-person cyber security conference before, it was really good. Um, and I, I was standing at the thing, and my friend Angie came around, she said, Lara, there's some psychologists around the corner. You're an anthropologist, they're psychologists, come speak to them. I was like, ooh, I'm quite excited about this. So I went around and I met Daniel, Dr. Daniel Shore and Zach Bloomfield. They've been working with the US government and military and NISC in the UK, looking at how cybersecurity teams can work collaboratively together to, you know, together to be effective successfully. Um, Daniel, very, we kept in touch and he very kindly said that I could speak about their work here with you today. So in their work, um, they found a number of misconceptions about collaboration. Collaboration takes more time than it's worth. Yes, it does, especially at first, because you might not know someone you're going to buy a donut for. I will come back to the donuts, so we'll explain the donuts. Um, but they actually found that once collaboration was ongoing, it actually generated more creative um, and effective solutions. Collaboration requires specialist digital tools. And the reason I put a donut up there, um, I'm famous, I will buy you pints of donuts, or at least will say you will until I'm in person with you. Um, food is a great leveler. If you know someone in another team and you sat down and had a cup of tea and a donut and chatted, you might be much more willing in the future to actually work together, to maybe think to ask that person something before you do something. That doesn't cost much. Uh, collaboration takes away your autonomy. This is a really hard one. Um, 
Because I suppose in some ways it does. And it takes us to do something uncomfortable and let go of maybe perceived things that we maybe think we can do better. Um, but actually you're driving collective effort. You, you can and take a load off yourself in some ways and learn and grow. And I don't know how to collaborate. Buy a donut for someone. You do not have to be an expert at this. You don't even have to buy a donut. You can maybe just, next time you're going to do something, you think maybe it would be good if I asked security that quick, or maybe I should ask the developer before I put this going thing through. That's all it takes. So they came up with um, principles of collaboration. So these were principles that they found worked, were successful with the teams that they worked with. They kind of tried to put it, hold, put it down. Uh, oh, by the way, I went on a mid-journey learning experience. It is safe to say I'm never going to be uh, a prompt writer. Uh, poor Josh, wherever Josh is, had to enter, like, put up with my ramblings um, while I was doing these. Um, so establish clear expectations. Okay, Ollie was talking about earlier, we're not very good at you know, being definitive. We do best practices. <laughs> um, elevate your individual goals. Okay, so everybody's clear, like what I'm, you know, what am I aiming for within this team? Articulate your technical expertise. That's fair enough. I know I'm responsible for this, this is my area, whatever it might be. Approach with curiosity. Oh, I hate growth mindset. <laughs> if we hear training in growth mindset one more time, but it is kind of true, but the curiosity thing. And I want to keep those principles in your head, right, for this next slide. This is, can you even see? This is horrible. This is, ah, <laughs> um, So you'll note in the orange, wow, I the color things, so an orange and a, a yellow. So if we go with orange, clear KPIs, understand role and function, HR is easier, easier to adopt technology, enthusiastic and talent pipeline. And then you look at the principles that they know, like they've worked with teams, and these principles have worked with teams. You establish clear expectations, clear KPIs. Elevate your individual goals. So you're, I don't know, we can kind of fit it into understanding role and function. Articulate your technical expertise, right? That kind of goes into adopting technology, you know what you are in your role and functions. What got me with this is how similar, like they're doable. Like clear KPIs, understand role and function, easier to adopt technology, enthusiastic and talented. The HR ones may be difficult because you can't, it's not always easy to get some of someone, someone might be terrible at their job, but it's. But there's so many similarities between the perceived ideas of what we think cyber criminals have an easier life than us and what has been established to work in teams of people in collaboration. Yes. Do you know what? I honestly, I can't, like, I'll just... I've lost it off the screen. Off. It's fine, right? I feel like I should turn around. At this point, I was going to talk about managing information cyber risk architecture. Honestly, it's a, right. Is everybody happy with me just waffling on and we'll try and get pictures and I really apologize? It's this not is not It's not your fault. I'm sorry. <sighs> and the Mac. It's the Mac. I've left Microsoft. Um, I love my, I, this is ironic. The next slide is a, a Microsoft um, architectural slide. I'm going to start holding my Mac up and go like this. It's very heavy though. Um, so yeah, so what I was going to show you, do you want to just show, like, what I was going to show you, is anybody familiar with the security architectures that um, Microsoft produced? Anyway, there's a, an AKA.ns security roles, and it's really cool. Um, I like the specific one that may or may not appear for you. <laughs> oh, this is like a really first nightmare, isn't it? Um, anyway, that architecture, it shows operationally how different teams move, like the workflows and the processes. It's vendor neutral, right? I'm not doing some adverse. It's vendor neutral, and I used to really like taking customers through it because you could see like if you're involved in cloud security posture management, where that sits and who you connect with, who the information should be going and where you should be picking up information and data from 
where it should be going to. How is it? This is interesting. I have to remember what the next slide after that was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. We are going to buy you a donut. Yes. <laughs> So the next part, we had architectures. What was the next part after architectures? Oh, James Duncan. So James Duncan, a friend of mine, yes, in Microsoft, but good for, I shouldn't say that sentence, I really don't like, I have so many good friends and lectures and amazing people in Microsoft. So um, he created a slide on set DevOps. We could get into a whole, I know there's going to be people going, there's no such thing as set DevOps, there is only DevSecOps and all of this stuff. But I really love the slide that may or may not appear for you in a, a minute. That delineates the difference between um, dev ops. Yeah, uh, that one. I feel like this should be like, oh, what's going to happen? Nothing. <laughs> Nothing. It's not there anymore. It will be. Promise? I haven't got any notes now. This is going to be hilarious. Right. James Duncan created this beautiful slide deck, if you can imagine. It says, set DevOps. Security is everybody's priority. Oh, there we go. Let, uh, I want to round of applause. <laughs> um, oh, no, it's coming in. Can I? Like, I'll just try and remember my notes. All <laughs> ten. This is. I will try and remember. <laughs> I know, I'm trying to be correct, right? Laura, the flashing is very it like forces you to pay attention. I like it. That's what we'll go with. Okay. Okay. Do you see the diagram? No. <laughs> ah, right, it's okay. It's okay. It's okay. I actually don't need my notes. If we could just get a pretty picture, so. I can do it on my notes. I can do this. I can do this. Okay. It's there. Yeah. Okay, managing information servers. I used to love this. Oh, right. I gave up. See, quickly there. Post your management. Did you see it? It's slightly different from security operations. Do you see how it works at the heart? I do like that security. It's uh, your management, right? That was what I was explaining. It's worthwhile, it's vendor neutral, but it's good to kind of think about. I would recommend taking a look at it if you ever get a chance. Oh, this is like, ooh, ooh, no, okay, you kind of seen it. Shift left. Um, so it was a really nice clean deck, and James was very kind to let me use it. Um, silo to dev opsec. I, I haven't ever said that word that often. A uh, kind of traditional waterfall where you created a product and then you went, oh, I need to do security, and then you have to start again, or you just put it out because you didn't care, and I don't know, somebody's house got raided or something. Um, DevSecOps, and that's where you're doing pretty good. You've got security built into your pipelines uh, using whatever tools you like. SAS, so staff, Git, DevOps, better. Um, sec, DevOps is when security is everybody's concern, right? It's not just in your pipeline, it's you being in a building and you're a developer, but you know Kieran in the, in the infosec team one steps, <laughs> okay? It's everybody's responsibility. It's leadership actually caring, possibly putting a seesaw on the board, I don't know, that's also terrible, like, it's a discussion to get into whether they should be there or not. But it's leadership because it has been proven, and we find this um, with secure scoring things, people were more successful when, successful when they had uh, leadership supporting their endeavors, right? Now, the point I want to make is security, and people go, security is not everybody's concern. Do you think that network engineer in MGM is thinking about security right now? Do you think all the tellers in the casinos are having to like write manually do you think they're thinking about security? Like, it is in some form or other, security is everybody's priority. 
But it doesn't have to be this like miserable thing <laughs> um, that we're all working together. I'm going to end soon. But so we did cover with flashing images <laughs> why criminal cooperation might get up into my head. A brief, it was an incredibly brief tour of the history of cyber. How do cyber criminals cooperate? A case study. Um, collaboration is not a gimmick, it's a very doable thing. Uh, security jobs to be done. I would have talked a bit more about that, but I got a bit sidetracked. <laughs> uh, Sec DevOps. It's everybody's concern. It really is. <laughs> it's not even funny with the world we're going into. Uh, and donuts. I'm going to explain the donut and then I promise I'm going. So, who's read the Phoenix, Phoenix Project Jinkin 2015? Not so, crap. so anybody who read it would know that the only thing more dangerous than a developer is a developer conspiring uh, with security. It's actually a negative in the book. John was good, like, he just wanted to put something in and he just hassled the dev team, you remember, and he put it in and then it was a disaster. Um, I kind of wanted to reframe this sentence and utilize it in a different way. Donuts, I explained why I think donuts are good, right? It's easier if you know someone, be open to communicating across teams. And this goes to everybody, not just security. It's not about blaming, like I hate this, oh, someone blamed the dev. Like, that's really annoying, because I've worked with developers, and yes, at the start they wondered why I wanted to talk to them, but eventually we worked together, and they truly needed, like, we needed to work together to secure the thing. Because I knew some parts of it, and they knew other parts of it, and between us we were able to do it. But on our own, we maybe wouldn't have done it so well. So next time security comes to you and you're really busy and you've got your Kanban board and it's like, oh, ah, ah. take a breath. They're not trying to be us. They're just trying to work. Like, make the time. And the same goes for security or governance people, compliance people. The dev team might not understand like what you're trying to do or the reason you're trying to do it. So actually, do not throw it over the wall and expect someone else to just do it. Because that was that, you know, the legacy thinking? It's not my problem. I identified the problem, so now someone else, like, that's not the world in which we live anymore. I'm sorry, it's not. And, you know, that book was released in 2013, and we are still from, like, I thought it was a cliche when I joined this community, like, the, you know, security bad and just a it's like we're telling ourselves this dialogue that we can't work together. Criminals are working really well together. We've proved, like Daniel and Zach's work has proved that like teams can be really effective and use the same things. So it means there's the possibility of us, like people tell us there is not enough of us, we're not good enough at our jobs, we don't know our environments, right? I would kind of like, and it's not come by hour, right? I'm a very, anybody who knows me, so I'm a very frank, blunt person, right? I don't like, it's not all, ooh, happy for it, you know. It's not like that. But it means to me that we have an opportunity to actually work. We just have to culturally change our mindsets on how we work. And that's the donuts. And if I could have got a donut sponsor, I would have. And I apologize, I'm not giving you all the Thank you for your time. Being very patient.